Good sound test. Hello and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, tonight I want to have some fun and look at some of the oldest recorded chess games. So these games are a lot of fun because people weren't very good at chess when these were recorded. Uh, and so we'll have a lot of fun looking at some exciting attacks and seeing where players were going wrong before the 1600s even rolled about. Or we're way, way, way in, in the past. So the first one I want to look at is, uh, I believe, the oldest recorded chess game that is, is still around, that people know about. It's between, and forgive me for my pronunciation, Francesco di Castelvi and Narciso Videoles, Videoles, something like that. Um, well, and I say it's between these two players, really, this is not the oldest chess game ever played because it was composed, I believe. It's kind of an interesting, interesting story behind this game. It was actually written into a poem and written in the Valencian language. There is a poem where the chess game is an allegory for this like love story. It's kind of, kind of weird. I couldn't find a translation of the poem, so I don't really fully understand how it's supposed to make sense. But the point of the story this game is supposed to reflect some some kind of, of love story. Um, so let's let's look at it. The the oldest chess game anyone knows about. And what else but the Scandinavian? Very uh, very weird opening to, to pick uh, for the first chess game ever recorded. And we get Queen takes d5, and that's what makes this game, um, like I said, the oldest chess game ever recorded. Back in the olden days, queens couldn't do this. Queens used to be super super weak. They used to only move diagonally, one space at a time. And then these people um, in Valencia were like, nah, super powerful piece. Queens can move in any direction as far as they want. And that was the development that pretty much led us to, to modern chess. Uh, so queen takes d5 played, and we get knight to c3. And so far, so good, normal Scandinavian stuff. Now, of course, queen a5 is a line, but um, in this game, we see black just retreating back to, to d8. So now, you know, with the benefit of 600 years uh, longer, no, 600 years or so of chess theory, we know that pawn to d4 is one of the main, main lines here, and white is going to try to take over the center, uh, get a little bit of extra space, and play with that space. Instead, we get bishop c4 uh, by white, which is also uh, a fine move. White just develops out. Black plays knight f6, we get knight f3, and so far so normal. This actually shockingly resembles modern chess so far. And then black plays this move, bishop to g4. And this is where uh, the age of the game starts to show. So this is our first huge mistake in the game. Does anyone see what's wrong with the move bishop to g4? Yeah, so there are actually a couple ways to take advantage, but bishop takes f7 is going to be uh, a, a big, big problem here. So this is a tactic hopefully you guys have seen before, but I assume it's a tactic that these two players had never seen before because no one had ever seen this tactic before. Of course, we draw the king forward, and then this pin turns out to be a discovered attack, uh, the, the classic reversal, and this knight attacks both pieces. So we'll pick up our piece back on, on g4. Now, there's actually another really, really strong move, which is potentially even better than bishop takes f7. So let's see if you guys can, can find that one. Knight to e5. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, I guess this somewhat resembles, uh, is it Legal's mate, where we, we can sacrifice our queen. Uh, and the point is, this king is left with nowhere to run, trapped by his own pieces, and we can just get checkmate right, right away. Um, but Fra Francesco didn't write either of those moves into the poem. Instead, he just chose this move, h3. Black goes ahead and captures on f3. Get queen takes f3. And now a another pretty big mistake, uh, e6 by black. So this mistake is a little bit easier to refute. Uh, we don't even need any tactics. We can just take this b7 pawn. And now black is in big trouble. Okay, so pawn on b7 is hanging. We take it. Black develops out the knight, defending this rook on a8. 
So let's see how we can continue to press here for a big, big advantage. White is doing very, very well. But if you just play some sort of normal looking move like d3 or d4, maybe black is going to have time to develop his pieces and uh, get back into this game. So how do we keep up the pressure? How can we keep up the pressure here? Okay, so bishop b5 is one option, but uh, remember our, our goal here is to stop black from developing. So if black gets fully developed, yeah, white's going to be up a pawn and, and will probably be a bit better, especially with the bishops. Um, but if you just do something like bishop b5, may, maybe you haven't stopped black after all. Just bishop d6 and castles on the next turn. What else can we do? We want to play very actively here. We want to keep making threats, not give our opponent a, a chance to breathe. Any ideas? Yeah, so knight b5, I, I think, is the best move. And yeah, probably black should still play this move, bishop to d6. Uh, but now we're actually going to have uh, quite, quite, a, quite a few options here. We could even consider um, taking this pawn on a7, just going up a second pawn. And if black does something like castles, we can come to c6 with this knight. We can even come back to b5 with this knight. Um, we have other options as well. We can just take off this bishop and keep up the pressure just and yeah black is going to get castled but now we've sort of removed black's best minor piece in, in that bishop on d6 that was pretty strong and white's just going to be a lot better so i think knight b5 is is by far the the best idea here you know you could play something like d4 and, and like i said you will just be better in these positions um but you know your, your queen is sort of sidelined we probably need to bring this piece back and, and black is going to stay in the game right has ideas of going e5 or something breaking in the center, keeping his, his rook active as well, um, it's still going to be a fight. Whereas after knight b5, I think black does just get into immediate trouble. Again, I think probably just knight takes a7, and you're up two pawns. It's going to be a tough, tough fight. If you go knight c5, I have this check as well as this check. Probably this one is simpler. And yeah, it's going to be really, really tough. So... After knight b5, rather than bishop d6, which I think is probably the best move, um, Narcissa goes rook to c8. So obviously, if after bishop, bishop d6, knight takes a7 is a good move, probably a pretty good move here. And that's what Francesco decides to play. Um, we get knight to b6, offering up this rook. Um, white takes it, as he should. Uh, if rook to b8 were to be played, uh, I, I think white is, is still just completely winning. We can just drop our queen back to some square. Really, I think any square. Um, this one, maybe knight e5 is a problem. So maybe something like queen a6. But uh, obviously, black should should save the rook. Instead, knight, knight to b6. Um, and maybe nobody had ever told Narcisso that rooks were worth more than knights. Maybe nobody had figured that out yet. But Francesco had that idea. So he captured the rook on c8. Uh, you get knight takes c8. Um, and now d4 which is uh, a pretty good move. White just wants to get the, the remaining pieces into the game and try to, to go after this black king. Of course, we just have a winning advantage at this point with our extra material and our safer king. Black goes knight d6. Bishop b5 check is a good response. Queen check is also fine. Takes, takes. Knight to d7. And white plays this really weird looking move d5. Um, this move doesn't really spoil anything, but it's it's just sort of an interesting idea. Um, the point for white is, I guess he's trying to open up these files, but probably better is just to develop your pieces. No reason to do this, it's kind of fancy stuff. So takes, bishop e3 is played, and now bishop d6. 
And now this is a really interesting moment in, in the game for me. So white to move here, what do you think the, the best move is? What is the best move? It's not like a crazy tactic or anything, but just the best move for us. Of course, like everything is winning. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's kind of a silly question. You can take the pawn, and you can, you can really do anything. Um, but as someone in the chat says, I, I think the best way to continue here is to actually long castle, greenside castles. And the reason is we just get a rook onto this nice file, we get our king to safety, and now black is, is just in a bad way. Um, and I find this moment in the game really interesting because white played the move rook to d1, which is much like queenside castles, but it's sort of worse in every way, right? We just would rather have our king on c1. And so that's why I'm going to potentially argue that this is not the oldest game of chess recorded, even though everybody considers it as such, because nobody castles in the game. And I think this move is pretty reasonable evidence. You know, I, I think even back then they would have understood that getting the king to c1 would be better here. Uh, so I think it's pretty reasonable evidence that maybe they were playing a version of the game where, where castling was, was not allowed. Um, which, you know, makes it not chess. That being said, though, rook d1 played uh, in the game. We get queen to f6 now by black, and now white's just going to be breaking through. Rook takes d5, queen g6, and now we get the funniest move of the game, bishop to f4. So uh, Francesco, I think, came up with this little tactic and was quite happy with himself. Of course, this is just a bad move. White should just castle, white should, you know, do, do anything, get the remaining pieces in the game, and then win. But instead, bishop to f4. So, of course, what's the problem uh, with bishop f4? What's the idea, and, and what's the problem? Any thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Hmm. So even worse than, than queen takes g2, uh, queen takes g2 is, is probably like an okay try for black, but yeah, we, we just go queen e4 check, and now we are threatening to take this bishop, and so if you go bishop e3, now g2 hangs, and okay, white is probably actually still winning, but obviously we've, we've spoiled quite a bit with, with our little trick. However, the ending is good for Francesco, uh, bishop takes f4 gets played in the game, and now who sees checkmate in two? Anybody? Go ahead and just shout it out if you see it. Queen takes knight, king f8, and of course queen d8 is checkmate. Um, a perfect checkmate, I, I believe as well. Um, I don't know if perfect is or there's there's some word for a checkmate where every square that the king can go to is, is covered exactly one time. And this is an example of that kind of checkmate in the oldest recorded chess game. Uh, so lots of fun. So this game is, is kind of a lot of nonsense, but you can see sort of a, a glimmer of, of chess strategy already kind of forming, right? They all very, very quickly tried to get their pieces into the game, and they even uh, had their play kind of revolving around the center for a little bit. Now, obviously, a lot of tactics and ideas were missed, but, you know, they're, they're playing chess. And I let me double check the year. Yeah, this was 1475 when this game was, was recorded. So pretty, pretty old. Now, that being said, I want to move from this to the first games of chess uh, ever actually played and written down. Uh, but before I do that, any questions on, on this one? The oldest game of chess ever? Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Now, let's move on to a player you guys might have heard of. Uh, has anyone here heard of Damiano? Uh, Pedro Damiano. Ben's nodding yes. The class not so much? You've heard of him? Yeah, so Damiano is one of those guys that uh, was w one of the, the first players to write down his chess games. I'm sure other people were playing chess games, but Damiano was one of the ones that wrote his down, and so that's why he is forever famous. 
Now, you might also have heard of the Damiano defense, which of course, I believe, goes e4, e5, knight f3, f6. So kind of fitting that a terrible, terrible, terrible opening is named after Damiano because they, they didn't know better back, in, back then. They said, ah, pawns attacked, probably you need to defend it with another pawn, f6. But of course, what's wrong with this move is knight takes e5 when you actually cannot recapture because this is going to give you a, a very, very difficult time. g6 and... You're immediately losing your stuff. Uh, but we don't get to see the Damiano defense in this game, even though Damiano is playing. Instead, we get knight f6, the Petra. Uh, and in response, we get knight takes e5. And of course, in this position, the move d6 is required. Uh, we need to kick this knight away before we can recapture on e4. This is Petrov 101. Instead, though, black plays this move, knight takes e4. So who remembers the problem with, with knight takes e4? The copycat strategy did not work out for black. Yeah, we go queen to e2. Now, of course, if you try to save this knight, what happens here? Yeah, d3, and if we move the knight away, right, knight c6 is check, and the queen's attacked, and the queen can't block, because the knight also attacks that square. Um, so, you might have heard that this just like loses by force, and black is, is just busted. But uh, kind of incredibly, uh, No Name, very famous player from the olden days, played a ton of games, Mr. No Name, um, finds the, the best way to continue here with Black. That Black actually does not have to resign after this knight takes e4 move. Black can, can keep the game going. And No Name finds the way to do it with this move queen to e7. So, of course, white captures this knight on e4. But now what's, what's the problem? Uh, what does Black do here to regain the piece? No, not knight c6. Um, okay, maybe maybe you can try this this move, but uh, white's going to play something like d4, and, and I think uh, that gets you into trouble. You just want to go d6 right away. Uh, and the point here is that black is getting the piece back, but white is going to be going to be a little bit better. So uh, Damiano plays d4. So so far Damiano is playing like a perfect game. He's the best. Uh, and now, of course, black does actually need to capture this pawn, or this knight on e5, and white is going to temporarily be up a pawn. It turns out this pawn is kind of difficult to hold on to, though. Black can just pile on the pressure, and the best way to continue with white here is just develop your pieces. You get into a position like this, and white's just going to play something like bishop f4, and uh, potentially pick up this pawn on c7, unless you play bishop d6. And black's pieces are just going to be pretty awkward. White is ahead in development and is going to have a, a pretty significant plus because of that. But again, you know, black's, black's not resigning. Instead, black was very, very, very greedy. So rather than taking the knight and giving up a pawn, black decided to go with um, f6 here and, and go come after this knight right away. So this position is very, very bad for, for black, but only one move really... Um, uh, gets the maximum advantage. You know, white can play normally and be a lot better because black has played this f6 move, but white has some ideas here that put black in immediate danger. So white to move here, what's the best way to keep up the pressure and, and punish our opponent? Again, this might not be like a, a knockout tactic, but one way to continue is, is better than the rest. OK, 
But yeah, bishop b5 is, is a perfectly reasonable move, but black is probably going to play c6, and just get the tempo back against the bishop. We can play something here that creates two threats in the position, and that's why black is, is going to really struggle. So what threats are you trying to make with bishop c4? Yeah, something like bishop f7. Yeah, so, you know, bishop c4 does create a threat. Bishop f7 is is kind of nasty, but, you know, black can can parry this just by taking the knight, I think. What do you think, Brian? Bishop e2. Um, how so? Right. Any other ideas? Yeah, knight c3 is the, the nasty move that, that black can't really deal with. So what are the, the two threats that we've made? Right. So first of all, we've defended our queen, which means that this is no longer a pin. So if black does like nothing, we can bring the knight back, be up a full piece. So this means that black is more or less required to, to capture this knight. If you don't capture this knight, we'll save the knight, be up a piece. Um, but what does that allow us to do next? What's the second idea behind knight c3? This one kind of is just tactically winning here. It's exactly right. So if this had happened in the game, and black tries to take, let's say, uh, with the f-pawn. We go knight d5. Now we're threatening c7 and the queen, and to take on e5. And this queen actually has a very tough time touching both, both of these squares. So queen d7, take e5, threatening to take d6, and just winning the game. If you go this way, then that's going to be even worse. Same with... Uh, Okay, there's really no other squares. <laughs> Same with d8, we're just going to take here, and, and black is in a bad way. So knight to c3 would have been really, really killer in, the, in this game. Instead, Damiano goes f4, which doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense. I think um, I think the, the players are sort of just dealing with what they see on the board. They see that, ah, my opponent uh, attacked this, this square again, so I'm no longer winning a pawn after captures. Right, black keeps this pawn. So Damiano was like, ah, I'll defend the square again. And now if he takes, uh, I get to win a pawn gloriously. So I think that was the idea. But of course, better just to develop the pieces here. Just get your pieces into the game and, and you'll be doing well. Better than f4 would have been, yes, this bishop b5 move, bishop d3, bishop e3, bishop e2. All of those just developing moves, I think, give white a, a pretty significant plus. Instead, though, we go f4 and black goes knight to d7. You know, renewing the threat to the, the knight, we'll say. Um, now Damiano does find this idea of knight to c3, and that's where the trouble really starts for, uh, for black. Black takes uh, the knight because that was threat number one, 
and then Damiano executes threat number two. So we found this knight c3 idea just, just to move too late, um, but it, it didn't cost him in the game. Everything still worked out. Okay, now we get this move queen to d6. Um, so here, uh, white to move and, and basically, basically win. And Damiano played the rest of this game actually very, very well. His only real mistake was this f4 move. So black's pieces are stretched very, very, very thin. But if we do things correctly, black's actually not able to hold on to everything. In fact, we'll see, maybe he's not able to hold on to anything. Yep, so takes, takes, and yeah. And the point is, black actually can't recapture this pawn, and, and that's why his position is, is so bad. So queen takes is pretty obvious what's wrong here. We can trade queens, take c7, and take the rook. Uh, but what's wrong with knight takes? What goes wrong there? That, I'm sure, was, was black's idea. Yeah, just bishop f4. And again, the, the power of development is sort of on full display, as it often is in these older games. The side that's more developed very often goes on to, to win the game. Uh, just nothing to do about this pin. White's going to win a piece. Um, but No Name is a, a clever guy. Um, he doesn't play either of these moves. Um, actually, I got the move order wrong. He goes queen c6 here. And now, of course, we get the move of the game. Damiano wins in style here. Um, showing some pretty complex tactics for 1497. Yeah, bishop b5 is just nasty. Um, and this queen is in a bad way. Take this bishop, knight c7, check, disaster. So no name tried to hold on with queen to e3. And now Damiano forces resignation with his next move. So white to move and finish him off. Yeah, bishop e3. This bishop is still untouchable. And believe it or not, this queen is entirely trapped. <coughs> Excuse me. Just absolutely nowhere to go with this queen. Every possible square is covered. And no name throws in the towel, resigns. So pretty fun game. Uh, and again, yeah, Damiano played uh, nearly perfectly. It was just this, this f4 move, which I guess is a very human mistake. Um, you know, your, your thing was attacked, so you might as well defend it. Uh, this was really the only, the only bad move by Damiano. Everything else is just tactics, tactics, tactics. And he, he calculated well. Um, so this, I think, may have been one of the, the first actually played chess games that, that we still have record of. Um, now, I did actually find another game from 1497, which I think is, is a little bit of a better one. This, this one's a lot more fun. And it's by uh, uh, Lucena. So who here has heard of Lucena? Hopefully almost everybody. So why have we heard of Lucena? He's famous for, for one thing. The Lucena position. Yes. So, of course, the Lucena position is a position in Rook and Pawn Endgames. Uh, potentially the most uh, important position to know in Rook and Pawn Endgames. Um, and it's the position where you're winning when you have an, an extra pawn in Rooks and, and nothing else. Um, now, I actually couldn't find any record of him 
showing that position, writing that down, or, or playing that position. But for some reason, it got named after him. Um, so that's, that's Lucena. He was actually one of the first chess players that wrote down his games, along with, with Damiano. And this one is also from, from 1497. So again, another contender for, for the first chess game ever uh, played and, and then recorded. And something really exciting happens in this one, as we'll see. So e3, move one by no name. Uh, classic no name, throwing things, throwing things into an off B position. We get e5, d4, takes queen takes d4. So of course, much better is to take with the pawn, just uh, keeping your, your claim in the center. But said queen takes, and Lucena goes d5. So far, so good for Lucena, putting his pawns in the center, taking control. Queen d1, and these players from the 1400s are never one to miss an opportunity to try to trick the opponent. So bishop d6. Of course, trying to trick no name into giving up his queen with queen takes d5 and bishop b4. But no name is wise to the tricks. Goes knight c3. We go knight f6 just to defend. Knight f3. And then Lucena goes ahead and develops with bishop to e6. So far, so, so normal. We get bishop d3, knight c6, b3. And now this weird move h6, but this actually makes quite a bit of sense. So why, why do we play h6? What do you think black is, is trying to stop here? What's the point? Right. Whenever you put a bishop on e6 um, in openings like this, and conversely, if white ever puts a bishop on e3, uh, a move you always have to be somewhat concerned about is the idea of knight to g5, just harassing this bishop, making this bishop move again. And this bishop kind of needs to be here to help support the d5 pawn. So h6 is a nice move, just um, not really a waiting move, but just an improving move. Stops this knight from coming to g5. Uh, white continues out now with bishop to b2. And black goes queen to d7. White goes queen to e2. And now this is why this game is awesome. It's the first game where someone castles. And the first time castles was ever recorded in a chess game, it was black castling queenside. Probably not my pick for what I would have guessed the, the first castling move uh, ever recorded was. But yeah, black castles queenside here. And now white castles kingside. And so I want to pause and, and kind of talk about this position a little bit because it's uh, really interesting how the understanding of the players at the time, even you know, these were like the, the best chess players because they were the only ones writing down their games. Their understanding kind of lines up with what you would expect uh, an amateur player um, to, to sort of think about the position as well. They sort of have similar ideas about things. So what's going on here? We've just castled on opposite sides. So how do you expect the rest of this game to go? What is black going to be trying to do? And what is, what is white going to be trying to do? Let's start with, with black's plan and black's ideas. What do, what do we want to try to do here? Yeah, you want to get after the king. So how would you go about doing that? Knight h7? And then what's what's the follow-up? Like what's what's your idea? Yeah, so you want to do an eventual pawn storm, right? You, you want to push these pawns forward, get after the white king. And that's exactly, uh, it's actually exactly what Lucena was uh, thinking in the game. And he, rather than play knight h7, he, he just played g5 right away. Just decided to start going and come after, uh, come after the king. Uh, it turns out, though, that that isn't quite the right way to continue in this position. So what's wrong with this idea of g5, do you think? Like, at its core, it's, it's a good idea. You want to push the pawns. You want to do a pawn storm and go after the king. But there's something pretty seriously wrong with this move here. Right. It's not really taking into account this bishop on b2. And now, back in the day, I, I don't think they had any concept of, like, endgames, really. They just thought, you know, uh, that's where my opponent's king is. I'm going to go try to take it and win the game. So I'm pretty sure that's what was going on with Lucena here is, like, 
OK, yeah, I need to attack the king and then win. Um, but it leaves behind all these holes. And black is, is going to have a really tough time if white finds this idea of knight to b5 when you know this is coming and this knight is active. And here we can even just start, start bringing in more pieces. We're threatening to take and take now. And it's, it's going to be really tough for, uh, for black to deal with this, just this long-term dark squared weakness here on, on the diagonal. So with that in mind, what is a better way for black to try to continue? If g5 makes too many weaknesses, what can we do? Any ideas? Yeah, okay. A move like bishop g4 isn't isn't terrible, and your your head's in the right direction. Um, if the pawn storm is either too slow or or too weakening, you're right in thinking. Well, then we should attack with the pieces. So that's that's the idea I was hoping you guys would would come across. Is rather than you know trying to do a pawn storm with g5 and make all these weaknesses. Well, I can actually just use the minor pieces here to really provoke some, some major weaknesses and give white a, a ton of problems. So, of course, as it sits, white's uh, kingside pawns are undisturbed, and they are sort of at their strongest when they're undisturbed, right? They could go, you know, white has all options available to him, playing h3, playing g3, playing f3, f4, anything like that, anything he needs to defend the king. So it's always helpful if we can force our opponent to disturb these pawns, make some weaknesses, something for us to latch on to. Um, so bishop g4 doesn't really do enough for us, I think. It uh, pins the knight, and that's, that's pretty nice. But again, I think something like uh, knight to b5 is, is probably going to be played, and white's going to be fighting back for, for these dark squares pretty immediately, I think. Okay, so if we take on h2, I, I think the problem is that there's, there's just knight takes, right? Yeah. But we do want to use threats against h2. We can use those, those kinds of threats to, to hurt our opponent here. Okay, did anyone consider knight to g4 as an idea? This, I think, is uh, the, the best way for, for black to continue here. And the reason is, is pretty simple. We're, we're just going to bring in our other knight next, and now all of a sudden, very, very serious threats against this h2 pawn. And uh, white is, is going to have a very tough time sort of uh, dealing with this. Uh, just to show an example line, let's, let's say knight to b5 gets played again. Um, I'm sort of just playing moves as they, they come to me here. Let's just say like bishop to e7. Uh, and now we're going to be able to use this e5 square, I think is, is a critical, critical point. So, okay, let's just say some move. We're going to play a move like d4, I think. Or we can start with this. Um, okay, I'm going to cheat. Because <laughs> I don't want to just like say nonsense moves. So, oh my god, I was so wrong. I thought knight to g4 was the best move. Okay, I'm, I'm the worst ever. You guys are the best ever. Bishop g4 is, is the best here. Yeah, and knight to g4, apparently knight, knight to, to b5 is just a problem. Uh, the idea I was trying to show is that after a move like, like rook um, a to d1, we're going to continue out now with the knights. And the point I was trying to make is that uh, we can provoke some weaknesses over here with something like h3. Um, and now, with more active pieces, we would be able to do this kind of thing. It turns out I was just wrong. I don't know how I messed this up. I think I was looking in a, in a different position. Uh, whoops, my bad. So you guys are the best. Bishop g4, best move. And we can continue out with, with knight to e5 and, and get after the white, the white king. Um, instead, though, g5. 
And yeah, now now black would be in trouble if if knight to b5 for for all those reasons that uh, that I said. Yeah, so the um, the point I was trying to make about disturbing the pawns over here on the king side also actually applies to, to the pawns on the queen side. And in this case, a6, I think, is just going to be too weakening. White, if not immediately, later on is going to have a ton of ideas of just snatching this pawn and, and coming, after, coming after the king. Maybe not immediately, but you know, we can prepare this kind of thing, push, push some pawns on the queen side ourselves. Um, so yeah, g5, and white goes knight to e1 rather than knight to b5. Um, now again, probably black should respond to these kinds of threats, but instead he just goes h5, f3, g4, f4, h4. So, so far so good for black. He had an idea. He was like, ah, opposite sides, castles. I know an idea. I'm going to push all the pawns and try to checkmate things. So that's sort of the corollary that I thought was really interesting because... That's sort of what you do, um, even even today. You're like, yeah, I, I don't know how else to attack. Let's just throw all the pawns at the king and hope for the best. Um, that being said, Lucena might have gotten a little bit carried away here. So white actually can just play this move f5 and does play this move f5. And this is defended enough times. And this bishop is entirely, entirely trapped. Um, so now Lucena goes for broke. He goes with this move h3, and now after takes um, black to move and create complications. So black is just 100% lost here. Black lost a piece. White is not checkmated by force. But Lucena found a, a good way to, to kind of make it interesting. So black to move. What can we do to uh, try and, and make it interesting? Try and give our opponent some problems. Yeah, definitely. So if we're friendly and we just take on e6, uh, white obviously has a lot of things that he can do, but I think something like g3 would be just really uncomfortable for us. Oh, well, I'm sorry. This is immediately winning a queen. Let's say we take back like this, then then this is also hanging. Um, so maybe just tactically, we, we kind of need to do this. Okay, let's say we do something like queen e7, trying to hold on to things. Now, again, we're going to run into problems with knight b5 and this diagonal, but also simply g3 is going to lock down lock down the king side and once the king side gets locked down we're just going to be down a piece for nothing and and probably losing pretty pretty quickly um so instead bishop takes h2 is is probably your best practical try here you're, you're just ripping things open you're getting after the king uh well well you still can so king takes now we can take on g2 with check king takes again and now down me or lucena goes uh with queen d6 so white has a couple ways to defend here um, and in the game he, he chooses kind of a weird one uh, i think probably the simplest is to come with rook f4 and just try to cut this queen off completely you know black is going to be able to make some threats with something like knight h5 um, hitting this guy but rook takes g4 is fine and we can also just give up this piece or this exchange back just to keep this this queen out of play um, instead though uh, he goes with rook to h1, which is also winning for white, but it's it's a bit more complex. So black takes off this rook and comes with rook h8. So now we still have some attackers, and the king lost a defender. King to g1. Um, so white is still winning here, still up a piece, but Lucena comes with queen to g3 now. Uh, and we get knight to g2. So if queen to g2, uh, I think you might have already blown... Uh, the game after queen takes e3, when I think black is escaping with at least a draw, and you, you might still get into even more trouble after something like like king to uh, king to f1. How do you get into more trouble? I'm not just, I'm not certain. Maybe rook h3. Maybe this move uh, this move as well. Um, ah, probably queen to f4 is is the issue. Actually, now that I see it. And if queen to, or sorry, queen to f4, and then if queen to f2, we have check and rook h2. So probably white has to just take the draw, and that would be the end of the game. So queen to g2 isn't good enough, which is why we get knight to, knight to g2 instead. Now uh, Lucena does something uh, very modern. He, he brings in more attackers, realizes the queen and the rook aren't enough, so we're going to bring in the knight to help attack. 
And after queen to f2, we want to keep the queens on the board. So we go check, and now g3. And this is the moment where white blows the game. So white to move here and keep defending. White is still doing well. Really only one move that uh, is even close. Everything else loses pretty quickly. Yeah, so our hero no name once again blunders blunders the game away. No name probably has the worst record in all of chess. Even when he's winning, you never want to bet on no name. Right. Queen to g1 is just the only way to, to continue. Uh, you, you can't allow this queen to invade with, with queen to h1. Uh, you're just going to lose, lose right away. So queen to g1 would have been the, the way to continue, and um, it's still going to be pretty complicated. For example, if knight to f3, I think white is losing pretty major material in exchange for this pawn. But we have stuff like king to f2, and white should still be doing, doing well. Uh, we're going to sack for this pawn, but white's up a lot of material already. Yeah, knight g1 we just take. And if you queen, I take it. You take me, I take you. And I have all four minor pieces left, which should be good enough. Um, so queen to g1 was just the only way. Instead, black or white played queen to f6, and now resigned immediately. <laughs> um, just queen h1, queen g2. And this is this is actually just checkmate. Just checkmate. Go king e1, check, check. And that's that's the game. That's the story. So these are the only three games that I know of that were played before the year 1500 or recorded before the year uh, 1500. And they're pretty wildly different. So the, the game from the poem, I think, is sort of the most nonsense one. And then Damiano and Lucena both really show a lot of more modern uh, chess ideas. You know, they're, they're calculating, they're seeing tactics, they're developing in the center, and they're playing some, some good opening ideas. Um, so any questions on, on this game before I move on to, to the last game of the night here? Um, potentially, potentially. Um, so this is the last move that Lucena bothered to record. Now, sometimes that means that uh, they resigned. Sometimes that means that the person writing down the game was just like, now I so obviously won after this, there's no need to write anymore. Um, and there's a lot of games where you actually only get a, a partial game, where it's, it just stops in the middle, and then they write, and then white went on to win. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, this is like checkmate in, in four or five. Uh, so either no name resigned, or Lucena was just like, yeah, clearly, clearly I won the game. Yeah. Um, I mean, potentially they did. Um, I don't think, I could be wrong, I don't think Lucena wrote down white resigns or something, or like white forfeits. Um, I think, it, yeah, it just writes, they just write that, that they won, basically, is all they do. Um, any other questions? So there's an interesting question in the chat uh, asking how notation was done back then. And I'm not entirely certain, but in general, they would just describe it in, in words. They would just say um, the, the, the knight moved to the square you know, in front of this, or that this, you know, they would just sort of write it out in, in uh, not plain English, because it wasn't written in English, but plain Spanish, probably, in Lucena's, in Lucena's case. Yeah. So algebraic notation is actually a very, very uh, modern in invention in the form that we know it. Um, I think in the past 30 years, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, is when it really came into form. Uh, before that, they used what was called descriptive notation, which um, was much like algebraic notation, but they just, instead of using letters and numbers, they would describe the files by uh, the starting position. So this would be the king's rook file. This would be the king's knight file, or sorry, queen's rook, queen's knight, queen's bishop file, queen's file, king's file, king's bishop file, knight's bishop, or 
king's knight file, king's rook file. Um, and they've had that for, for quite a while in some form. I'm not sure when exactly that they did, did come into form. Yeah, this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H system, I think, was, was in the 80s when it uh, first kind of came to be. I don't know why it took so long to come up with a grid system for a game played on a square board, but, but it did. Um, Albert in, uh, in the chat says, 1475 isn't old. You can't believe that there are no earlier records of chess games. So it's sort of a technicality. There are older records of games but not with the rule set of chess that we know today. So like at the top of the lecture I mentioned, the queen used to be a much less powerful piece, the bishops also used to be much less powerful, and this was just the first recorded game with, with this, this kind of rules, these, these rules that we're, we're familiar with. So there you go, first game where anybody castles and Lucena does it with black castling queenside. So as fun as those games are, I want to jump forward in time a little bit to a very, very famous uh, old chess player by the name of Greco. So we're jumping forward more than 100 years. So chess has been around a while now. People know a little bit more. And uh, in most of the games recorded by Greco, uh, it, it's going to look a lot like the Damiano and Lucena game, where games end very, very quickly. They're decided by checkmate. Um, they, they, just, they write down these, these flashy games where they won quickly with a tactic, and that's, that's all we really get to see. But I wanted to show this game uh, uh, between our hero again, No Name, and, and Greco, because it shows how ahead of his time Greco was. So most, you know, 98% of, of all the games are him just like winning really immediately because the people he's playing just had no chance. But this game lasts 50 moves. And Greco shows a lot of really advanced concepts that uh, you know people just like didn't have time to to be taught. It just chess wasn't around long enough. So I wanted to look at this game for for that reason. So we get a French defense, um, and it's an advanced French. And Greco immediately goes with c5. So so far so good. C3 is normal. Knight c6. Knight f3. Bishop d7. And Greco's playing the mainline theory. Good for him. Uh, Bishop e3. And now he plays this move c4. So this move um, isn't really played so much today. Uh, so who knows why? Why is c4 not so good? Yeah, Brian? Right. Um, these days, it's better understood that when white has this massive center, um, we really do need to break it down somehow. Uh, otherwise, we'll see how you can run into trouble uh, in this game, actually, if you try something like c4. We need pressure against the d4 pawn for counterplay. Instead, c4 gets played. Uh, in the game, white goes b3. We get b5, a4, a6. So a lot of tension on these pawns now. And then it's immediately broken. They capture. The a file opens. We get a trade. And now b takes c4. And now I'm going to say I think this is the most impressive move of the game by Greco. Um, I think probably many people here, myself included, wouldn't think for very long, and then would play b takes c4. Um, but Greco comes up with this move, d takes c4. So what is d takes c4? Why would you ever capture away from the center like this? What do you guys think? Greco had a really nice idea behind it. Yeah, exactly. It opens up this d5 square, which is not the most intuitive thing, right? You know, it seems like you would just want to take towards the center and then, you know, sort of play over here. But Greco is, is doing this long-term planning where he's like, well, where am I going to put my pieces? And he, he realizes that this d5 square is just a beautiful square for a knight. And so he plays d takes c4, opens up this d5 square, and, uh, go, you know, is, is going to just try to positionally outplay his opponent. Um, white plays bishop e2 just to develop. Now we do see knight g to e7 and knight d5. So fantastic idea by Greco, and, and black is now just a lot better uh, out of the opening. We get bishop to e2, or bishop to d2, stepping away from uh, the knight and defending the pawn. Um, Greco continues with bishop e7, knight to g5, and bishop takes g5. So uh, not my favorite move of the game, uh, but I think Greco didn't want to see this knight landing on, on these strong outposts, so he decided to kill it while he still could. Um, now bishop takes g5, 
And finally, castles. Bishop to f3 is played, and knight to a5. So not, not my favorite move either. Um, knight to a5, I think a lot better was, um, yeah, the, the idea of, of playing h6. And the point is here, after this bishop goes away, we're going to bring this knight back, and then we can support this knight a little bit better and continue to, to infiltrate uh, on this a file. Instead, though, uh, knight to a5, uh, white can and should take this uh, knight on d5. Queen takes d5 is still a good outpost. And then here is where uh, we, we finally see the ramifications of this move c4. So black got a lot out of the opening uh, by putting this pawn on c4. But long term, you have to be very, very, very cautious uh, whenever you give up your tension on the center in an opening like the French. Because these pawns are going to give white a, a lot of space in the center, and that's going to lead to some pretty dangerous attacks. So without this pressure against d4 to, to keep the white pieces dealing with your threats, uh, white gets a, a lot more of a free hand to kind of come and attack you. So white to move here. How should white have continued in this game to kind of punish black for this earlier c4 move? While you're thinking, someone in the chat mentions the game Shot Tranche, and yeah, that was one of the uh, many precursors to, to chess that is much older than, than chess. Used the chess pieces, but again, slightly different rules. Um, no, black just played queen to d5, and so now, how can white launch an attack? Yeah, queen to g4 is, is exactly right, and, and now you really kind of see the, the problem here for black. These pawns effectively cuts black's position in, in half. You see this knight, this queen, and even this bishop are really unable to help influence the, the king's side. These, these pawns in the center are just way too strong. And you can imagine if this pawn were back on c5, we'd have all these threats of, of taking on d4. Uh, we can bring our knight back and, and pressure this center. And by breaking through in the center, we're also going to help out our king. But with this pawn on c4, we just have no way to, to really combat these guys. Uh, and that's the problem for, for black here, is there's not a way to, to really actively uh, attack these pawns. So after queen to g4, white is immediately making threats of, of bishop to h6. You should do something like king to h8. And now white's just going to bring in these other pieces to help attack. Uh, knight to b3, for example, allows this move knight to e4. And now all of a sudden Greco would have been in, in quite a bit of danger. Um, so... That's always an important idea to keep in mind. Yes, here, um, Greco, like, despite having this pawn on c4, has a great position because his pieces are all very, very well placed. But it can really turn quickly when, when you have given up such a big center like this. So something to be aware of. So queen to g4 would have been nice. Instead, f4 was our hero no name's uh, choice. We do go bishop c6 now, making this threat. And no name just goes queen to d2. So definitely, again, Queen to g4 needed to be played. You need to get active. You need to find counterplay. Instead, queen to d2, knight b3, queen c2. And now Greco decides to actually sacrifice this piece. So a, a bit unnecessary. Better was just to try to infiltrate down here on the a file. So we get a good piece sacrifice. Now bishop to e4. And going a bit quickly because we're low on time. Uh, Greco sacrifices the piece to try and make these passed pawns worth something, especially with white's bishop a little bit locked out of, uh, out of the game. And then white comes up with this really good move, actually, knight to b3. Um, without this move, I think white would be in, in quite a bit of danger. Um, and here Greco sort of lets his advantage slip. He, he was doing well with these pawns, but after knight to b3, he just takes. And now, after takes, 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 I think this is one of the first instances of someone getting caught 
Uh, on the back rank, Greco has back rank issues, so he's not able to play the move b2, effectively winning the game. Has to deal with the back rank first. That's why we get h6. Um, and now white is able to stop the pawn at the cost of a full rook. Uh, and so we get potentially the first ever recorded opposite colored bishop endgame. Now, what can you tell me about opposite colored bishop endgames? Are they uh, typically winning or typically drawn? Typically drawn is, is the stereotype, yes. Uh, because um, these bishops are operating on different planes of existence. Right? Very difficult to push this pawn through a dark square when your light squared bishop can just never help it get there. And that's the case here. If no name were the best, he would have uh, been able to hold this. But as always, you know, never bet on no name. No name always seems to, to not do well. Um, and he did end up losing this game. He started off well, went with g4 and h3. And now after h5, he, he lets it slip. So the best way to hold the position here would have been to take on h5. And now we have time to bring our king in. We can even come to e3. And now we're just going to go h4. And the point is here, our bishop can cover the king's side. Our king can stop this pawn from, from going any further. And white is going to be able to hold this without too many difficulties. Instead, uh, no name made a very human mistake. He, he said, I don't want to uh, ruin my pawn structure like that, quote unquote. So instead, he ruined his pawn structure like this. And this just gives up uh, a little bit too much, a little too many weaknesses. Um, so let's see here. We get king g6, uh, king f2, bishop d5, king e3. And now this really interesting move, h4. So uh, I, I both like and, and kind of dislike this move. So it's really nice to try and, and pin this pawn to a light square where your bishop can, can come after it. And that's actually how Greco ends up winning the game. But I think h4 was actually unnecessary. We, we could just play this this way, force this pawn to this dark square, and now our king is going to have an avenue into the position, and white isn't going to be able to, to hold all the pawns. Um, but h4 is a, a good idea, uh, just not quite the right execution. And now after bishop to g2, so sort of white's last chance, he needed to play this move g6 and go for this endgame, which is a little bit harder to hold, but I think should still be drawn. Um, instead, he went bishop f8, and now Greco wins a second pawn. And with these two pawns so, so far away from each other, white just has no chance. No chance of holding. Makes a queen. And either white resigned, or Greco just stopped writing down the moves, uh, as, as always. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed some of these oldest games of chess ever recorded. Again, I think the, the oldest one played is either that one by, by Damiano or, or Lucena. And they're, they're both a lot of fun to look at. I had a lot of fun looking at all these games. Uh, a lot of them are, are kind of nonsense, but you can really see glimmers of, of pretty sophisticated chess strategy uh, coming, coming through in these games. Um, coming up right after me is Women Grandmaster Talia Cervantes. So please stick around for, for her lecture. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, as always, my name is Caleb Denby. Thank you all very much for coming out, and I will see you next time.